So when a child sings or used to sing, I don't think they do anymore, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, it's not twinkling. Something powerful, dramatic, and dynamic is happening to it, right? <laughs> well, yes, and we call that twinkling. Yeah, so, right. yeah, there's starlight coming billions of, uh, or millions of light years, well, it depends on if it's a galaxy, but hundreds of thousands of light years across space, and it's a perfect point of light as it hits our atmosphere, turbulence in the atmosphere jiggle the image, and it renders the star a twinkling. And by the way, planets are brighter than stars, typically, like Jupiter and, and Venus. Venus has been in the evening skies lately. And uh, if you go twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, and you, w I want, you want to wish upon the star, most people are wishing on planets. <laughs> right. That's why the wishes don't come true. <laughs> the planets are the first stars to come out at night. Don't you sometimes feel uh, sad about breaking all these myths apart? <laughs> no, no, because I, I, I think it's uh, some myths are, are, are deserve to be broken apart out of respect for the human intellect. That. Um, no, when you're writhing on the ground and froth is coming out of your mouth, you're having an epileptic seizure. You have not been invaded by the devil. We got this one figured out, okay? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> discovery moves on. So I, I don't mind the power of myth and magic, and, but take it to the next frontier and apply it there. Don't apply it in places where we've long passed what we already know what's going on. I came out of the planetarium, and that evening I sat thinking about what you said in the show about you acknowledged the Big Bang and you, and I remember that Hubble rewound the process mathematically, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, and calculated that everything, matter, space, energy, even time itself, actually had a beginning. So it turns out that it was not Hubble, although Hubble had the data that enabled the calculation. The person who did that was a Belgian priest, George Lemaitre, He's a, he's a priest, physicist, physicist priest, right. okay? What a cool thing to have on your <laughs> business <laughs> you card. You got, every, you got people coming and going with that. But uh, he calculated what the implications of Einstein's general relativity, which was the new theory of gravity, would be with Hubble's expanding universe. And he says the whole universe may have begun in a singular point in the past. And thus, the uh, Big Bang, as a phrase, was used pejoratively of this idea, but it stuck. <laughs> Incredible flash of energy and light, though. And matter, and yeah, all of this, all of the above. Do you give people who make this case that that was the beginning and that there had to be something that provoked the beginning, do you give them an A, at least, for trying to reconcile faith and reason? Um, I don't think they're reconcilable. What do you mean? Well, well so let me say that differently. All efforts that have been invested by brilliant people of the past have failed at that exercise. They just fail. And so I don't, I, I don't, the track record is so poor that going forward I have essentially zero confidence, near zero confidence, that there will be fruitful things to emerge from the effort to reconcile them. So, for example, if you if you knew nothing about science and you read, say, the Bible, the Old Testament, which in Genesis is an account of nature, that's, that's what that is. And I said to you, give me your description of the natural world based only on this. You would say the world was created in six days and that stars are just little points of light, much lesser than the sun. And in fact, they can fall out of the sky, right? Because that's what happens during, during the... Um, Revelation, one of the signs that yeah. the second coming is that the stars will fall out of the sky and land on earth. To so even write that means you don't know what those things are. You have no concept of what the actual universe is. So everybody who tried to make proclamations about the physical universe based on Bible passages got the wrong answer. <laughs> so what happened was when science discovers things, and you want to stay religious, or you want to continue to believe that the Bible is, is unerring, what you would do is, you would say, well, let me go back to the Bible and reinterpret it. Then you'd say things like, oh, they didn't really mean that literally, they meant that figuratively. So this whole sort of reinterpretation of the fig how figurative the poetic passages of the Bible are came 
after science showed that this is not how things unfolded. And so the educated religious people are perfectly fine with that. It's the fundamentalists who want to say that the Bible is the literally, literal truth of God that, and want to see the Bible as a science textbook who are knocking on the science doors of the schools trying to put that content in the science. Uh, enlightened religious people are not behaving that way. They're saying, yes, yeah, science is cool, we're good with that, and use the Bible for, to get your spiritual enlightenment and your emotional fulfillment. I have known serious religious people, not fundamentalists, who were scared when Carl Sagan opened his series with the words, The cosmos is all that is, or ever was, or ever will be. That scared them, because they interpret that to mean then if this is it, there's nothing else. No God and no life after. For, for religious people, many people say, well, God is within you. or yeah. God, There are ways that people have shaped this, rather than God is an old gray-bearded man in the clouds. So if God is within you, what I'm sure Carl would say, in you, in your mind. In your mind, and we can measure the neurosynaptic firings when you have a religious experience. We can tell you where that's happening, when it's happening, what you're feeling like at the time. So your mind, of course, is still within the cosmos. But do you have any sympathy for people who seem to feel, only feel safe in the vastness of the universe you describe in your show, if they can infer a personal God who makes it more hospitable to them, who cares for them? In this, uh, what we tell ourselves is a free country, which means you should have freedom of thought. It, I don't care what you think. I just don't. Go think whatever you want. Go ahead. Think that there's one gods, two gods, ten gods, or no gods. That is what it means to live in a free country. The problem arises is if you have a religious philosophy that is not based in objective realities that you then want to put in the science classroom. Then I'm going to stand there and say, no, I'm not going to allow you in the science classroom. I'm not telling you what to think. I'm just telling you in the science class, you're not doing science. This is not science. Keep it out. That's where I, that's when I stand up. Otherwise, go ahead. I, I, I'm not telling you how to think. I think you must realize that some people are going to go to your show at the planetarium and they're going to say, aha, those scientists have discovered God because God, dark matter, is what holds this universe together. So is that a question? <laughs> it's a statement. You statement. know. It's you statement. know they're going to so, say that. So the history of discovery, particularly cosmic discovery, but discovery in general, scientific discovery, is one where at any given moment there's a frontier. And there tends to be an urge for people, especially religious people, to assert that across that boundary into the unknown lies the handiwork of God. This shows up a lot. Newton even said it. He had his laws of gravity and motion, and he was explaining the moon and the planet. He was there. He doesn't mention God for any of that. And then he gets to the limits of what his equations can calculate. So I don't can't quite figure this out. Maybe God steps in and makes it right every now and then. That's, that's where he invoked God. And, the, and Ptolemy, he, 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 he bet on the wrong horse, but he was a brilliant guy. He formulated the geocentric universe with Earth in the middle. This is where we got epicycles and all these, right. all this, the machinations of the heavens. There was still a mystery to him. He, he looked up and uttered the following words. I, when I trace at my pleasure the windings to and fro of the heavenly bodies. These are the planets going through retrograde and back. The mysteries of the earth. When I trace at my pleasure the windings to and fro of the heavenly bodies, I no longer touch earth with my feet. I stand in the presence of Zeus himself and take my fill of ambrosia. What he did was invoke, he didn't invoke Zeus to account for the rock that he's standing on or the air he's breathing. It was this point of mystery, and in gets invoked God. This, over time, 
has been described by philosophers as the god of the gaps. Mm -hmm. if, if that's how you, if that's where you're going to put your god in this world, then God is an ever-receding pocket of scientific ignorance. If that's how you're going to invoke God, if God is the mystery of the universe, these mysteries, we're, t we're tackling these mysteries one by one. If you're going to stay religious at the end of the conversation, God has to be more to you than just where science has yet to tread. So to the person who says, maybe dark matter is God, if the only reason why you're saying it's because it's a mystery, then get ready to have that undone.